All right, well, welcome everybody to another Image Builder SIG, part of the OpenShift Commons community. And this week, we have Michael Withrow with us, who is going to talk about how to make your containers more secure um, with some of the technology from Twistlock. Um, he's going to talk about it in the context of OpenShift. Um, the way that we do these um, SIG meetings is a little different. Um, we're going to let Michael talk for you know 20 or 30 minutes and give a demo. And then we're going to open it up um, for a conversation with everybody who's on the line. You can ask questions in the chat um, and talk amongst yourself in the chat while he's talking. But once um, he's done talking and he's taken a breath, uh, we're going to turn it on and just let everybody um, talk um, with Michael and ask any questions that they might have. So without any further ado, um, welcome to the Image Builder SIG, Michael, and um, why don't you take it away? All right, thank you, Diane. I really appreciate it, and thanks everybody for uh, for attending. I understand uh, time is money, so I uh, really appreciate it. All right, so as as she said, my name is Michael Withrow. I'm the director of solution architecture here at Twistlock. Um, so, um, what do we do as as a company? So, really, what we're focused on is is you look, uh, you know, you have the Docker ecosystem and you have enterprise needs, um, and essentially, we are the technology that really fits in between uh, those two to, to bridge them together uh, from a security posture perspective. So what you really want to think about is that we provide a single pane of glass for um, really the Docker ecosystem. Um, and, you know, as you look at this is OpenShift and, you know, whether you're using OpenShift or whatever that technology is, maybe you're using an OpenShift registry uh, and all those kind of things like that, really think of it as a single pane of glass for that, that entire uh, setup that you might have in, in that particular topology. Um, so looking at a little bit of the vision uh, from, a, from a product perspective and, and a company perspective, um, you know, as you look at it, the, the value proposition for containers is, is, um, is, is out there. You know, look at the DevOps, the, uh, the immutability, the statelessness that exists from a containerized ecosystem perspective. Um, you're, we're seeing massive adoption across the globe. Really, every, uh, every industry pillar, every geo uh, is, is a massive adoption uh, ring that's going on from containers. Uh, one of the things that, that easily gets overlooked um, is that essentially um, as the security teams get integrated as DevOps or whatever is leading that particular charge, um, uh, essentially there is, you know, I'm taking, hey, look, my traditional monolithic approach to securities and can I take that and apply that to containers, right? Um, and then as I look at that, is, is containers uh, a better opportunity uh, for, uh, for security or less or whatever it is? And, and that's a lot of the conversation that we have with customer after customer as they're looking at, at, at you know, pr productionizing their containerized ecosystem. The reality is, as you look at it, containers really uh, change the attack vector that exists for your application when you move it to a container. And really what we're talking about is that with the right tooling, Essentially, you can improve the security posture of that application by moving it to a containerized technology. And I'll kind of walk you, uh, you know, through our technology to show how that that really comes true. Uh, really, what we're talking about from a capabilities perspective, just to baseline everybody, is that we're, we're essentially talking about uh, the fundamental characteristics of, uh, of uh, containers. You know, whether you're talking about the minimalistic state, right? Hey, look, I'm building um, a, a Redis image, right? And essentially, um, I have the Redis application uh, in there. Uh, and that's essentially a singular focus uh, from that particular perspective. And it's very declarative, right? So I'm a, uh, basically building a, a JSON file, a Docker file, or maybe a Docker Compose file, uh, or maybe I'm doing it through OpenShift and I'm having my OpenShift deployment, right? And I'm building a deployment uh, for what that uh, that image is gonna look like. Uh, and it's very declarative in that regard. So it's repeatable and um, essentially every single time it gets deployed, it's getting deployed that way. So very declarative in that nature. And most importantly, essentially a container by nature is immutable, right? You don't have agents in there making them stateful. Essentially they're stateless uh, and immutable in that particular regard, um, which like I said, those are the, the key terms that I want you to think about as we kind of walk through uh, what we do from a, from a product perspective. So when you look at it as well, really driving that point home, there's there's a couple of key security advantages that exist with a containerized ecosystem over a traditional monolithic, right? And really, uh, it really comes down to uh, the automation, right? So so heavy automation, integration with the CI pipeline process, uh, maintenance through metadata, uh, and really what you want to think about is that uh, when you look at uh, key uh, containerized uh, deployments, essentially what's happening is that essentially a traditional monolithic application gets broken down, 
right? So essentially inside of a monolithic application, say a uh, three tier application, you might have you know, uh, three nodes uh, in there representing each level of the tier. And across each of those nodes, you might have 15 applications in there, right? And that essentially makes up your application. Well, in a containerized ecosystem, you wouldn't have those three VMs. You'd actually have 10 containers, each container representing that particular uh, application, right? As it ties into that particular you know, overarching application in that regard. And essentially each one is autonomous in that regard and individually updated without you know impact across the other one uh, across that tier and so when you look at traditional monolithic right essentially what you're looking at in that regard is that you have heavy dependencies you have um you know you have agents all these kind of things like that so now when you talk about upgrades right um essentially now you have to go through and you have to do regression testing you have to go through cmdb boards get downtime uh all these kind of things like that you have to work through right uh, from that particular perspective. So um, when you look at it, right, now start pulling back, what are some of the security challenges that, that containers actually bring to the mix as well, right? And so commodities of scale is the biggest thing, right? So uh, we're commonly seeing, as I look across uh, uh, enterprises that we're talking to, hey, look, um, I have 5,000 images. Um, I have, you know, you know, 10,000 containers or, or 15,000 containers, uh, which is, you know, five to eight times greater than what we typically saw in a virtual machine environment. So that sprawl uh, from those kind of things like that and not real, um, not real ownership uh, for what is exposed across that. So you have, you know, uh, legacy images, those kind of things like that. Now I'm on version 100 of this image, but I've still got one through 99 that exists in this environment, uh, those kind of things like that. So the VM sprawl, you know, the sprawl conversation has kind of come back to when you talk about containers and obviously a heavier uh, rate of change. Um, instead of with traditional VM environments, you might see, um, you know, a, say a quarterly or a bi biannually type of update of that application. Whereas with containers, uh, daily, weekly uh, updates are, uh, are commonplace in that particular regard. So a higher rate of change uh, across that ecosystem. Um, and then essentially the security responsibility moves, right? So now it's essentially further upstream. Uh, now it is in the hands of the developer and not necessarily falls in the infrastructure team, right? So in that regard, you think application specific, right? And not that, that edge-based security conversation that typically fell in the infrastructure team. And now it's making security an entire stream based responsibility, um, whereas developers are typically last of the line uh, when you talked about security. So now when you look at it, right, essentially, um, when you look at containers, what is the what is the value prop of containers, right? Essentially, by nature, a container is secure. I mean, it's portable, right? So essentially, um, you now you get a, away from that hypervisor conversation, that that vendor lock-in uh, to X, Y, and Z. Maybe you're run, running a multi-cloud, right? Maybe you're running, um, you know, uh, in a hybrid cloud, a public cloud, or whatever it is. Essentially, uh, you know, when you look at our technology, essentially we provide that portability as well, because essentially not only does our technology protect the containerized ecosystem, but essentially our technology is containerized technology as well, right? And so essentially what that means now is think of a REST API-based product that really hooks into the entire ecosystem. So maybe you deployed an AWS or maybe you deployed on-prem and you're laying down OpenShift, you know, v3.2 inside of that inside of that environment, uh, deploying an OpenShift registry, uh, those kind of, or, you know, Red Hat-based registry, those kind of things like that. Essentially, we can provide a single pane of glass into, into that environment. And when you look at our product, essentially it's a lifecycle management based product, really providing cradle to scale security, right? So really starting in that CI pipeline process, maybe using Jenkins, maybe using drone, maybe using bamboo, whatever that might be from that particular regard. Um, essentially we can uh, integrate uh, deeply in that environment. So as those images are getting built, before they get to the registry, before they get attached to a deployment script and pushed out into pods, those kind of things like that, we're gonna integrate at that particular point. And then as it does uh, get pushed into a registry, and then now you have it in runtime out in a pod from that particular perspective, we're gonna provide a security posture of that entity all the way through all the different steps that it's gonna take in its life cycle.
And we do all this without you having to give up any of your control. Essentially, all the data lives in your environment. So like I said before, maybe you have a private cloud uh, where you deployed OpenShift in that private cloud. And essentially, now you would drop TwistLock into that OpenShift environment, which is in your private cloud. Uh, all the analysis um, that's taking place from a security perspective is happening in your environment. So we don't pull anything out uh, to, in, uh, to assess or analyze your particular environment. Um, we have we have many ways uh, that we can support. Like I said, I talked about private and public. Uh, we have many customers who are government air gap network segregated environments. Uh, we fully support them through tar files uh, as well uh, from a product perspective. So, uh, what do we do from a product perspective? Essentially, as I alluded to before, we are lifecycle management, so build through run. Uh, and, and one of the key things that we do and really where most customers reach out to us is around the vulnerability management. Right, so, so think of integrating uh, into the build CI pipeline process where images are built, we're gonna assess and actually restrict uh, the state of that image based on thresholds, those kind of things like that. And then as that image moves upstream into the registry, right, we're gonna assess the vulnerability state, the malware state, uh, you know, uh, the threat state of that image as it exists in the registry as well. And then, you know, essentially now downstream, and now you're running that inside of a pod, inside of your OpenShift environment, uh, we can uh, tell you the vulnerability state of that image and actually restrict that image, um, uh, actually restrict that vulnerability from running inside of your uh, OpenShift pod as well from that particular perspective. Uh, we also tie in compliance, right? So think CIS benchmarks for containers, uh, industry standards around compliance, those kind of things like that. We can tie into that environment as well and restrict, um, you know, uh, say you have a security posture you want to maintain, and essentially now someone, you've done a good job of building a clean image, now someone tries to run that image, say, as root as an example, right? But you don't want that to run as root, or they expose a certain port um, or SSH or something like that. Um, now, when they run it, we're going to assess that state from a compliance perspective, see that it's outside of the compliance posture that you're trying to maintain, and restrict that image from being run inside of your pod, right, from that particular perspective. Um, and then we also tie in some access control mechanisms. As you look at OpenShift, um, there's a couple different ways that you can integrate from that perspective. Um, and then rounding it out from a product perspective, we tie in anomaly-based detection across your running entities through our runtime defense mechanisms. So pulling the covers back a little bit further, uh, what you want to think about is that essentially how we work from a product perspective is that first and foremost, we want to generate a bill of materials off of that image. Maybe the first time we see that image is through the CI pipeline, right? So we have native plugins for uh, Jenkins and Team City. Uh, if you're not running Jenkins or Team City, we have an independent product called a TwistLock scanner, which is really a, a, a shell script you call from, uh, you know, a, a shell file, right, from that perspective, uh, and that that really allows you to integrate with any type of registry or any type of CI pipeline process that you might have. Like I said, you might be a bamboo shop or a drone shop or a circle CI or something like that. Um, and essentially all you do is you'd have a shell script would call out that, that SH file and then it would basically on build, it would scan and you'd pu pump out those results from that trigger perspective. Maybe the first time we see that image is actually in, you know, uh, upstream in your registry, right? Uh, like I said, as long as it's a V1 or V2 based registry, uh, we can integrate it with it, right? So, you know, Red Hat's registry, um, like I said, all the, all the industry registries, we can integrate with it. And so as that image gets moved from your CI pipeline process into that registry, um, you know, it's been there for a while, right? So we can assess the state of, of that image as well as it as in that registry. And really what you wanna think about is how we're doing that is essentially what we're doing is simply enough conducting a static image analysis off of that JSON file, uh, really understanding you know, what's the base layer, right? Is it Debian based, Alpine based as an example? Um, uh, you know, What's the framework? Are you building a Java app or a Ruby app or something like that? And then in that read write layer that sits on top, um, what is, your, what is your custom code set, right? What are the files you're stipping, uh, sticking in there? What are the system calls? Those kind of things like that, we're kind of looking in there. Uh, the idea is that we basically grab that uh, those signatures and stash them in the Mongo database that comes with the product. Uh, now that we have that information, or that you have that information in your environment, because we is, is not the term that I wanna, I wanna uh, leave with you today, is essentially, like I said, everything sits in your environment, uh, is that we want to detect the CVEs 
the zero days, and the malware that exists against the entities that we defined in that image, right? And to be a little bit more trans, uh, transparent in that regard, um, you think of packages, right? So the package manager in that particular regard, uh, we're gonna look through and go through the packages. Maybe you have a tar file in there where you're gonna basically expose a package or install a package through that tar file those kind of things like that. We can see that, inspect that, um, and then now we've we've stashed that. So now we know, hey, look, you have these packages as part of the image, whether that's since they're installed through Package Manager or through some tar file in that particular regard. And so now as that image goes through its life cycle, essentially now we bring in a real-time intelligent CVE streaming service where we pull from a wide range of providers, think of all the different operating systems, all the different languages, from NIST, CIS, think the NVD database, those kind of things like that. Uh, we have some zero day, uh, we have a, we partnership, uh, partnered with a company called Exodus, which does zero day mal hunting. Uh, we have uh, partnerships with some um, IP and malware sites as well uh, to, to pull in that IP and malware data. And then we have some uh, pretty, pretty aggressive machine learning algorithms as well that we kind of pump in. Uh, as you as you kind of go through and that that lends to the life cycle right because now from a scenario perspective you built a java based image uh, that has wget and um, um, ssh exposed or whatever it is from that particular perspective um that's that's your that you're deploying out uh, as it went through the ci pipeline process we assess the state of that and through the threshold based process you know it got allowed to get posted to the registry but obviously now it's been in the registry for three weeks right um, so, so now over those three weeks, of course, you know, these components have lit up and the package manager has told us that there's vulnerabilities, we're going to pump into the environment and light up those, those components across that ecosystem like a Christmas tree in that particular regard. Um, but essentially, we don't even stop there from that particular perspective. So let's say whether or not you have it in the CI pipeline process, that image is in the registry, it's been there for a month, or now you have a running container that's been running for six months, right? That's where the CVE service is going to come in. And at, as a as a package becomes vulnerable, essentially, we're going to, we already know from a signature perspective where that package uh, transpires across your ecosystem. And essentially, all those images, all those images attached to containers, attached to pods, we're going to light that up. Right, and then taking it further, we actually have the ability to actually block those vulnerabilities as well. Uh, whether it's on a, you're trying to build a image and when someone tries to run that image, um, think image integrity in this particular regard. So you have a scenario where, hey, look, you've built a clean image, right? Um, and now you have a clean image on build, but that image has now been living in the registry for three weeks. So obviously over the three weeks, a couple of the packages now have vulnerabilities. So now when someone tries to, do a deployment off of that image essentially and you have the policy set to block essentially we will restrict that image from being deployed into a pod because it has vulnerabilities in it so the idea from a devops perspective was that image would get thrown away because you don't upgrade or patch containers right you throw that container away and you deploy another container in its place or another image in its place which doesn't have that vulnerability that someone your admin or whatever can do a uh, openshift deployment off of into your environment and if you have an open a run Running OpenShift pod, right? Uh, think of us as a proxy that that you know works through the Docker socket in that particular regard. So if we need to restrict, based on you have policy, you don't want to have us. This application is very critical to you. You don't want to have it ha out and running with vulnerable uh, vulnerabilities. And so essentially, you could move the policy to block. And essentially, in that regard, we will restrict. Uh, if now you have Java in that image, and all of a sudden Java lights up, essentially we would restrict uh, that image, right? So think of in that regard, we would kill that image because essentially it's adhering to containerized best practices you know if a container is anomalous has an anomaly in it or a vulnerability in it you don't patch it or upgrade it you throw it away and build another one right um, so essentially we can talk about you know what that means from a scenario perspective but we allow you from a product perspective to one be alerted to the fact there's a vulnerability and if you choose to restrict that vulnerability uh, so this is what that CI pipeline process looks like. Uh, essentially, you know, think of a, you know, a developer is going to be building an image, uh, injecting it in the pipeline. We're going to go through and the CI tool is going to notify us via the API or the plugin uh, that, hey, look, a scan needs to be initiated. We'll conduct an ad hoc scan and publish the results back to that CI pipeline process. And then essentially through there, you can do with, uh, you know, a threshold-based failure, right? So think low, medium, and high from a CVE scoring perspective. So what you would say, so maybe you have offshore developers or partners are giving you images. You could pump them through this process and see if you even want to uh, check them into your registry. Uh, maybe it's a trusted registry from that perspective. Um, and then so think of a scenario where maybe the 
the step to build the image is step three. Step four would be for us to scan it. Step five would be for us to publish the results. And step six would be for you to push it, you know, down to your registry or to your downstream registry, whatever that mechanism might be. Uh, compliance. Uh, so here, I'll kind of I'll kind of grease through this. We can talk through this a little bit more um, uh, as we kind of get through. But the idea here is that we can tie in CIS benchmarks for containers, and we can also tie in all of your industry standards. Uh, maybe you want to have application-specific configurations that you want to adhere. Every time we deploy Mongo, it has to be deployed this way, or every time I deploy Tomcat has to be deployed this way. We can enforce that from a compliance perspective through data sets. Uh, you upload the data set to us and we allow in a very granular fashion for how you want to enforce that compliance posture, right? So through actions, right? So the action might be, I wanna be alerted uh, when this particular configuration is tripped. Maybe you say that, hey, look, um, uh, or maybe it's an application specific configuration. Think, hey, look, I have a, um, a Tomcat website. I want to make sure that every single time it's deployed, it's deployed over 8043 and not 443, as an example. So now a developer, a new developer comes in, uh, kind of missed that part of the uh, the common engineering criteria. So when they de deployed it out, essentially they tried to turn it on over 443. You'd have a setting in here said, hey, look, if this image is running off of 443, restrict it, right? I want to block that configuration, kick it back to the developer to move it over to 8043, and now they can actually do a deployment off of that. Um, and we also in here also tie in image integrity, right? So what you want to think about here is uh, think cryptographically certifying images. So you would have a, a, a scenario where, hey, look, one, as I'm building that image, now I know that that image is trusted. So I want to make that image trusted. So I'm going to integrate with content trust and, and, and associate a SHA value as a tag with that image on push maybe through my CI pipeline process or whatever it is. So you would take your, in this scenario, take your, your Red Hat registry and associate that with TwistLock as a trusted registry. And then we would in turn associate that with policy and say, hey, look, now that you've built this gold image, essentially now what we're gonna do from a process perspective is cryptographically certify that and say that only these people can pull that cryptographically certified image. And more importantly, those people in that group can't backdoor or go around that policy. And as an example, they don't want to use your trusted image. They want to go to Docker IO and pull the Swiss cheese version of that image. We would restrict that from a process perspective. Uh, so access control, uh, you know, you look at OpenShift uh, has some capabilities is there. Really the key thing you want to think about here from a product perspective is that there's a lot of ways we can complement in that particular regard. Uh, but really what we're kind of talking about in this particular regard is really providing the detailed audit trail off the back end off of every single transaction that goes across that Docker daemon. So whether it's a user-based access uh, mechanism or whether it's a privilege, think pseudo or root in that particular regard, we provide that forensic trail of what transpired across that daemon as we kind of go through. And now, uh, you know, now you have running entities, right? And so essentially we round out the product uh, with our anomalous based detection. Uh, and really the idea here is that we really bring uh, what we did in vulnerability management where we did that static image analysis. Uh, you kind of see that here on the left uh, from that particular perspective. Um, and then we plus that up with the launch time metadata, right? Uh, when you kind of now you deploy that pod and now you have that running entity, uh, we're gonna look at that launch time metadata. Uh, through that, we're gonna detect certain things, right? So think application specific detection here for our first leg of machine learning, right? And so what we're, gonna, what we're doing here, this is very application centric. Hey, look, we detect HTTPD. This must be an Apache file. Hey, let's go find the config file, figure out what ports are associated with this particular deployment or this might be Mongo, let's go look at these files and find this SH file or whatever it might be in that regard. Maybe it's Tomcat or Redis or something like that. Essentially, that's what the machine learning there is looking for application specific tags and then pulling that out. So, because the idea from a product perspective is we wanna build a predictive model because we're taking advantage of the declarative nature of containers. And so by nature, hey, look, you're saying, hey, look, the purpose of this container is to run Redis, right? So we're going to grab all that Redis specific configuration and we're going to whitelist that topology out. Uh, the key thing about this is that essentially we do that completely automatically on the back end from a product perspective. And all you did from a product perspective was tell us where your images were. In this scenario, all you would do is drop TwistLock into your OpenShift environment 
and we would take it the rest of the way. We would assess the vulnerability state and we would provide the anomalous based state of your entities as they're running because we already know what they should be running because we built a predictive model off of the images that are running inside of your OpenShift ecosystem. And like I said, the value prop here is that we did that completely automatically without you having to do anything from a product perspective. And then we also introduced um, a feature set we call Twist Lock Advanced Threat Protection, which is a deeper set of machine learning algorithms. So here, think of a scenario where, hey, look, you've deployed uh, this image or this container into OpenShift, right? And so now there's OpenShift normal processes that run on the back end. If we're auditing every single transaction, essentially what that would mean is that essentially we're generating a lot of white noise, false positives in that regard uh, of traffic traversing across your environment. So through that, we would see, we would detect OpenShift, no, no, because we run OpenShift, uh, we pump it through our machine learning algorithms, and we see that these are the normal processes, and then we include those in the whitelist for that particular application. So now what you're left with uh, from a resultant perspective is really these, those only true anomalies that you have to react off of, right? And then essentially that's ever evolving. So as, as Diane was, we were talking about before, you guys just, uh, OpenShift just released 3.3. So if you go from 3.2 to 3.3, there's some changes in there. And really what that means from our perspective is that we're gonna pump in 3.1, 3.2, 3.3 into our machine learning algorithms. Look at that, look at that OpenShift environment in a running state and grab all the signatures off of that and then pump it through our intelligent stream service. So essentially you get the benefit of that in a continuous state. All right, so I'm gonna show, uh, let me skip, uh, I, time to limit it, I would walk you through a little bit deeper, but essentially how we bring this home, and this kind of gets into the demo from that to the perspective. The idea from an architecture perspective, as I was alluding to before, we are just a containerized based infrastructure. So on the left is our intelligent stream service I was talking about. See all the different CV information, you know, we're pulling from the Red Hat ovals, uh, oval feed, uh, you know, from NIST and CIS, uh, you know, maybe uh, it's Java based or Python or Ruby or something like that. Uh, then we have our threat feeds where we partnered with Exodus, with Proofpoint. Uh, we're getting those zero day, those those IP and malware data. And then in the Twistlock Labs, uh, we're writing a, a, you know, a deep set of machine learning algorithms, constantly enriching those and taking all the images that sit in Docker IO, taking all the, you know, ECS and OpenShift and Kubernetes and all these different environments and building them up and pumping them through the machine learning algorithms to assess the running state and, and, and basically filter out all that operational noise. So like I said, you're only left with application level anomalies uh, from that particular perspective. So on the right is your environment, right? Like I said, whether it's a public cloud, a hybrid cloud, a private cloud, uh, maybe you're deploying it on just physical servers. The idea is that you have a Docker daemon that, in that regard. We're gonna give you an SH file, which has two tar files in there, one for our console, one for our defender. You'll do a Docker run off of those, so to speak, um, and basically deploy them as containers on top of your Docker daemons in whatever capacity they might be in, right? Simply enough, we have uh, the console is an Alpine-based image running a Node.js console with the Mongo database. In there is where you'll obviously configure uh, all of your policies. Out of the box, essentially we have all the policies turned on and set to alert, right? So think of it as a, as a, as a starting point, a guideline. Um, really, we're thinking about it from a time to market perspective. Um, so essentially, you, you know, out of the box, all you have to do is basically deploy our product in your environment and then tell us where the registry is and tell us where your containers are. And essentially we'll start assessing that, right? Um, but really we're just alerting that particular perspective, but maybe you have a PCI based application or something, uh, a certain application that has PI data you're really worried about. Uh, maybe you wanna uh, build a policy that's very specific to that application and move that to block because you're really worried about, you know, the security from that particular application. We allow you the granularity to segregate out your applications, your containers, your images, those kind of things like that. Um, like I said, you'll, you'll suck in your users and groups. We don't really care what kind of um, identity you have uh, to basically provide access control. If you're using some other access control mechanism, we integrate with that as well, complement. Uh, like I said, providing those audit trail, those, those kind of things like that. Um, and then, you know, your cluster management, right? So obviously Kubernetes is a native uh, capability for us. Uh, so same thing since OpenShift uh, sits on top of that, that's where the tight integration that happens from our perspective. Uh, so as you lay that environment down, we just implement, uh, we just integrate with the Docker socket in that regard and function as a proxy in that topology. Um, but now that you've done that, you build out all your policy, the idea is that you cache that policy on the Defender. The Defender wears multiple hats in this environment. 
So think across your uh, OpenShift deployment, this would go on all of your slaves, right? From that particular perspective, um, as you, as you kind of go across. So maybe you have, like in my demo, I'll show right after I get in this, I basically have a three node um, uh, Kubernetes cluster um, with a manager and, and two slaves in that regard. So deploy the defender across that topology. And so as I start deploying pods into that entity, we're gonna start assessing uh, the state of those pods inventory, um, and then assess the state of what we discovered in that inventory is kind of how it works. So really that defender, um, like I said, is, is one for configuration management, assessing what's there, providing that inventory data, uh, enforcing the policies that the console has set, um, and then providing an audit trail off of all the transactions that happen across that daemon, regardless of what what level of transaction they are, right? So think of a scenario where, um, hey, look, you've done your due diligence and, and limited pseudo uh, from that perspective and built in all your access control policies for all the OC commands in that particular regard. Uh, now an admin tries to run an OC uh, policy, they get an access denied from that particular perspective. What does a normal admin do? They're going to run a pseudo OC, you know, in that particular perspective uh, to try to scale that out. Uh, and if they do that, essentially we've got them from a forensic perspective. We would detail out that from a forensic trail perspective. Um, so essentially, you know, this is the easiest way that, that you would look at it from that particular regard. Um, you know, hey, look, you know, you have an orchestration manager. Um, you know, you have your uh, your Docker engine down with your orchestration agent in that particular regard. Uh, we just integrate those defenders in that particular uh, perspective uh, for the, through the orchestration if you use an access control. But if you're just using vulnerability management, runtime defense, essentially you really only need uh, us on the slave nodes in that particular regard uh, to provide the vulnerability state um, and the uh, runtime state of, of the containers in that particular topology. So before I get in the demo, I will kind of pause um, and ask if there's any questions uh, before I get into uh, the demo from that particular regard. No, so far there, I haven't seen any questions yet. Um, so why don't you move right into the demo because we, then we'll have some time after the demo. That'd be great. Perfect. All right, so um, as we go through, so this is our TwistLock console. Uh, from that particular perspective. So what you're kind of seeing here is, is, is here I have a, a really simple OpenShift deployment, right, with a, with a Red Hat console and, and Node 1 and Node 2 in this particular regard. I've already deployed TwistLock on that topology. And like I said, out of the box, TwistLock is already, you know, starting to assess the images, looking at the risk state of the containers that are part of that. Um, you know, look at the access violations, the system calls, the process violations, network file system violations that exist across this topology. So the idea is that, you know, first and foremost, maybe, you you know, through part of your OpenShift deployment, you have a registry, right? You'd integrate in the registry uh, from that particular perspective. Um, and then now it's essentially a resultant of, of your configuration, right? So from a flow perspective, what you essentially have is we've really broken the UI into three buckets. Uh, first and foremost is configure. Here, I want to configure what I want to protect, right? So my users and groups, um, maybe it's, I'm an LDAP environment or SAML, maybe I'm uh, a Swarm or Kubernetes or Mesosphere or OpenShift. Uh, essentially, I can integrate those in. These are just a, a config file turn on. Uh, by default, uh, you know, um, uh, essentially you would toggle those on. So regardless of whatever orchestration engine you have, you would tweak the config file and then you would light that, that capability up. Um, we have a couple of different ways to uh, deploy the Defender. Uh, and essentially the native way is right through a curl command. You would run it um, directly on your slave um, inside your Kubernetes cluster. Um, and so uh, this is a good point to kind of pause and talk about. Uh, we do have a, a large bank of customers that are already running OpenShift. And one of the things that we're doing from a product perspective is going to make the, uh, we're going to generate some deployment scripts for TwistLock inside of the OpenShift environment. So it's not just, you know, a native install. It's actually a managed entity inside of your orchestra, uh, OpenShift environment. So uh, essentially that'll be, a, we're about two, two to four months out from having that capability out. Um, but essentially in the interim, essentially think of it as a manual deployment inside of your OpenShift topology. And then once we get the deployment scripts, it'll be really tie into the, you know, the full capabilities of the OpenShift topology. But the idea is that, hey, look, here I have those nodes and I've, I've kind of scaled out uh, the OpenShift environments uh, in this particular regard. 
Uh, you know, we have the ability, so as you go for, say, like I said, you're doing access control, you would deploy in the master, but you want to do vulnerability management and compliance and, uh, you know, uh, um, runtime defense, you would use that, the node in that, that, that particular perspective, uh, but you have those kind of deployed out uh, from that particular capability. Here's where you start building out policy. Um, so think Kubernetes in this regard, which kind of ties into the OC uh, commands in that particular regard. Uh, but the idea is that, hey, look, here I have all the API calls and I can get very granular, you know, do I want to allow or deny them access to those APIs? Um, and here's that level of granularity I was talking about. You can start building out, um, hey, look, here's application A, here's application B. Maybe I segregate at dev level, maybe I segregate at staging or prod. Um, those kind of things like that. I start building out policies that line up to that. And then I start segregating out who can do what and then the audit trail off the back end. So from a trust perspective, um, you know, the key thing is, 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 you know, vulnerabilities, right? So, hey, look, here's the vulnerabilities. Um, what I can do is, hey, like maybe I'm building a Java-based application. So simply enough, and then by default, you see that set to alert, but maybe I want to tweak that to block, those kind of things like that from a product perspective. Here in compliance, uh, we actually go through and we have all the CIS benchmarks. So as an example, um, one of the things that I wanted to show was a real quick demo for you guys. So I'll kind of restrict uh, limit memory usage on a particular application, think buffer overflow, those kind of things like that. And now 5.10, uh, from that perspective, I'm going to set it to block and I save that out from a policy perspective. So I'll kind of toggle back from that particular perspective. So now I have this host here running uh, from that particular perspective. So now what I'm gonna do is simply enough, I'm gonna try to build another app. Um, obviously this application that we've built obviously has a vulnerability in it. So now we've set policy to say, hey, look, let's run that, that, uh, that image. I'm gonna try to run that image from that particular perspective. And now it's going through and building it. So what you'll find is when I go to status, uh, from that particular perspective um, is essentially when it's going through is essentially it's going to get blocked at container create, right? So once I go through and do a describe uh, off of that one, you'll see a line in there and says, nope, I can't because, um, uh, so let me hold on, let me do demo von with row six uh, from that particular perspective. And so now as it's going through, uh, what we're going to see is when it gets to that point, essentially we'll see a note in here. I'll just do a refresh. And essentially you'll see where we come in and block that particular perspective. And see there's a successful pull. Now it's trying to do a container create. It started. And essentially that's going to get blocked uh, from a snare perspective. Right as we go through, uh, just kind of waiting for that to catch up. All right, I'll give that a second. But the idea is that essentially now um, we have that blocking. So as that deployment happens, essentially what you want to think about is when it gets to the point where it actually does that actual deployment off that pod, when it goes through that call, goes through the daemon, we're going to pick that up through the socket and assess that image and see that it has vulnerabilities and restrict that from being done, right? So obviously every time the pod tries to push that, every time the deployment scripts try to push that into the pod, we're gonna restrict that, right? So OpenShift is gonna continually try that, obviously, right? So we're gonna block that every single time in that particular regard um, until you basically pull that out, right? And so what I'll show from a, a scenario perspective is that, hey, look, um, you basically attach this image and then simply enough, I can remove that vulnerability. You can see that deployment kind of going through. So we'll kind of let this catch up um, and it's gonna make a liar out of me. So it's created, it started, it's still started in that particular regard. Um, I'm kind of waiting for it to catch up. Uh, from that particular perspective, and then I'll show, because I know I have it, um, what I wanted to show, I'll have to pull it in here. Um, I don't want to show you guys, I'll get it in there running in a second. The demo gods always uh, mess with me in that regard. Absolutely, doing a live demo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, but essentially what I'm getting at is that essentially when it gets to the point where it's actually building the container, see it started the container. Oh, wait, maybe I didn't have the policy set because it actually started the container in that regard. Uh, maybe I missed setting the policy. Let's do that. So I have, oh, I know why I did that because I did it on the wrong policy. So let me do, let me do 510. Let me set that to block. And then let me save that. And let me toggle this one and go to 510 and turn that one off so I don't break anything. Um, from that to the regard, I'm going to save that. So now, <laughs> to do the demo correctly, let's just do another one, right? Just for the essence of time, um, I'm going to build 
uh, another one. And then you'll see, because now that I have the policy actually set right, you'll see when it gets to a point uh, where, uh, so what did I build? So that's, what did I build, seven? Yeah, so then off that particular perspective, uh, now we're gonna go through, now we should actually go through when it gets to that point, um, we'll see that actually restricted from a policy perspective. So now kind of walking back through while that's cooking, um, essentially what we've done, what we have here is that obviously you're looking across all your pods, we can see the pods uh, in here, see the state of the pod, uh, the last commands that were ran across that pod. Here's the first one that I kind of did from that regard. I can pull up, you know, some compliance inf info. Obviously this container's running, uh, you know, uh, as root, uh, you know, uh, app armor's not configured, uh, set comp uh, and memory, uh, limit memory usage. You know, obviously I checked 510 uh, in that particular regard. Um, I can see the host apology. Here's, you know, <clears throat> so from our perspective, we're not really a host layer protection product, but essentially we're from the Docker daemon up, right? So as you have that Docker daemon, you deploy uh, OpenShift on top of that Docker daemon, essentially we're protecting that up across that particular topology. And you can see how the state of the host is running from that particular regard. Think the network card, think uh, the storage, because if those get affected, that affects the containers on the topology. And then as we kind of go through, hey, look, here's the daemon, the daemon configure uh, files you know, uh, set comp, those kind of things like that. Notice everything looks good. Uh, now we're kind of looking at the images as they exist across. Here's, you know, on the registry, um, here's Docker IO, uh, you know, as they look across. And what we bring in from a product perspective is that, hey, look, here I'm now breaking down the vulnerabilities, right? And so actually go out to the NVD database. So you can see the state of that vulnerability, but really providing eyes into the environment. So here's that image, right? Here's the compliance posture of that image. Here's the process info. Here's what we detected as part of that image. This is going back to that whitelist I was kind of talking about. Here's the packages we kind of determined that were part of that. You know, as we go across, you see this is a pretty big image in that regard. And then really as you look across, really the, the CVE perspective of that particular uh, package that's in that image as well. You can see how they light up in that particular regard. And then kind of from a configuration perspective where that image is deployed, uh, you can kind of see that configuration data. So all across this, you can see, hey, look, this one has 29. So I can go in here and see the vulnerability state, you know, go out to the NVD database and then do that. So really what you're looking at is that all you've done is you've deployed a, um, you've through your CI pipeline process, uh, whatever that might be, you've integrated in the registry. We've already added the registry in here. So now you've dumped that image in the registry. We're gonna automatically assess the state of those images that sit, sit in that registry, right? So here's that Red Hat registry. Here's basically 3.1. Um, and here's the state of those images in 3.1, right? Um, and obviously 3.3 is better, right? Uh, from that particular regard, so 3.2, 3.3, as you move across, we're showing the state of, of those, uh, those images uh, that sit in those registries from that particular perspective. And then like I said, as you now, as you, as you deploy those images across the topology and not, now start deploying pods, we're giving you eyes in the state of those pods across that OpenShift deployment. So now I'll kind of take a breath and see if there's any questions. Well, it's 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 really cool, and it's you know it's interesting to see the the vulnerabilities in there um, in some of the OpenShift containers too, uh, and hopefully 3.3 is better. Um, I'm I'm I did a, a lot of work a, a while back um, with compliance and audit. Reporting um, and scanning for that. Do you have any um, output? I mean, I see CSV, but like um, like a vulnerability report that you can. So, so how we do? So right now in the product, we are going through. Um, we're starting um, a UI remap. So some mm -hmm. stuff will come out in that regard. We haven't really finalized a plan in that particular regard. But really, the easiest way to answer the question is that uh, essentially throughout the product, if you need to export anything out, we really give you the ability to do a CSV export. So you obviously can filter. So you get very specific information. It's just not a raw dump. Uh, but really throughout the product, it's just basically a CSV export of the vulnerability state, the compliance state, um, those kind of things like that. Okay, cool. Well, that's really handy to have. Now, if you can only make it look at all of the licenses for all of the module. Uh, uh, so that's a really yeah. interesting question. So we've actually, um, so when you look at it, right, so we looked at, um, you know, when we sat down and we thought about this product, right, uh, essentially we looked at, you know, where does it fit in the, in the market, right? So obviously there's a lot of good products already out there that do hardware-based assessment, those kind of things like that. 
um, you know, think cloud, cloud, uh, cloud passage, uh, tripwire, those kind of things like that as we kind of go through. Um, and then we already have, we have a great partnership with a company called Sonotype who does licensing integration as well, right? From that to the regard. Um, so we said, okay, well, hey, look, you know, Sonotype obviously does deep in the licensing. So we kind of said, well, we're going to stay in our niche from that particular perspective. Yeah, well, that's, that's, yeah, that was the bane of my existence um, working for yep. a company. I, I've heard that from quite a few customers. So I, I know exactly where you're coming from. <laughs> so, yeah, because I think in a new containerized world where people can, you know, bring containers in from lots of different places, this security level of, of auditing and, and, and compliance reporting is really um, spectacularly necessary. Um, but also um, wondering whether someone has a, like a, a piece of software in their container that, you know, your company doesn't, you know, doesn't have the license for um, is another, you know, is always a big yeah. So, yeah. So, um, so really the, the easiest way to answer that is that, so Sonotype is one of our partners and they do have that capability and we've actually integrated, uh, we were finalizing the engineering of integrating our products together. Right. And so if you were a Sonotype based customer, that would be one thing you could get because obviously they have the licensing, the job of a specific information. We have all the containerized ecosystem and really think of bridging those two capabilities together from a product perspective to really help answer that question. But obviously it's very, um, you know, products uh, specific in that regard. So um, let's, did your demo complete? Um, yeah, back? so let me, let me go back and see where it's at and see if we actually got that restriction, right? And so obviously I, I demoed this all morning and it was working, per, there it is. So now you can kind of see, hey look, error syncing pod, skip, fail to create, running containers, because it's got basically, basically policy blocked it, right? So now, essentially it is in a basically a looping state. So OpenShift is basically trying to make that OC call to kick it. And every single time that call comes through, our integration with the socket, we're blocking that, right? So simply enough, um, I could go into here, go into trust, you know, show kind of the flexibility of it, right? Go into compliance, go into this policy, um, check my setting, go into 510 on uh, in that particular regard, and then set that back to alert, save that off. And then when I go back into here, um, essentially, uh, you'll see that deployment kicks off, right? And from that to the regard, and then OpenShift will go off, and then that, that's running uh, in that regard. So now it just started um, that regard, and now it's off and running. So does it add anything into the, because uh, we're seeing it now from in the terminal mode, and we're also seeing it on the twist lock page. But if you've got someone, if the IT team installs twist lock, and I'm a developer, how does this surface in the OpenShift UI? Do I, you know, if it, if I'm using it online? So or... that's kind of what we're talking about. Is that so? One of the things that we're working on from a product perspective is actually bringing that to fruition, right? So so actually having some exposure in the UI. Um, I know my CTO just had a meeting with Red Hat, so those those conversations are going on as we speak, um, mm -hmm. and we are working through that, right? So all the different uh, vendors we're working to make sure that it's it's the most uh, seamless experience as possible. And so that's one of the things that we have to do, right? So like I said, as where we're at right now from a product perspective is manual integration into your product. But one of the things that we want to bring and we're working to bring in is that automation through the UI. Yeah, perfect. Well, yeah, that, I think that's a natural next step. So hopefully we can get that done and get you back and um, show it servicing for yep. them. Because I would think that a developer would go like, well, okay, WTF, you know, what's happening? And, uh, <laughs> Yeah. So the, the reality is, is that how it would work on the back end, right? And so so to bring that scenario home, kind of what we're talking about here is that I'm just kind of showing that reaction, right? Um, but what's going to happen is as that deployment goes through in the UI, this is kind of what's happening on the back end through the daemon, right? And this is kind of what you're seeing in that particular regard um, as, as things kind of go through. And that would get exposed back in the UI in that particular regard that deployment failed, or whatever it is. And when they you know look in the logs, that's the kind of information they're going to see on the back end. Right, so look at really kind of what I showed here is the back end integration, uh, and then what we need to build is that front end uh, experience. Don't get me wrong, I'm I'm loving that you can do this and you can block that. I think that's a wonderful thing, and I think anyone who's on the ops side of the house is really loving it too. So um, I'm just trying to think, visualize in my head where we would expose it in the UI for open. Yep. So, yep. Thinking so ahead. What I should yeah, so what I should do is maybe we'll follow up with you, Diane, is as, as we get, you know, further down from an engineering cycle perspective in that regard, you know, we could, you know, that's what the idea is. We'll schedule another call and show where we've, you know, now six months later, here's where we're at as an example. Absolutely. I think that's a, that would be a great thing to do. 
So um, I'm see, it's, you've done a really good job and been very thorough because there haven't been really too many questions here. So um, is I'm going to give everybody a last chance, and maybe if you could go back to your slides and put up your informational slides so yep. people know how to get a hold of you. Do you have questions? Um, we'll kind of wrap this up a little bit. Here we go, because we are almost at the end of our hour. And if anyone has any questions, pop them into the chat or raise your hand and I'll unmute you. But I, I think you've done a, a very awesome job covering off this and hopefully there will be no flaming containers out there um, mm -hmm. afterwards. And we'll post this video um, in the blog post at blogs.openshift.com shortly. Probably take us a day or two to get them um, cycled through. And Great. we will have them all available and ready for you on our YouTube channel as well. So thanks again, Michael, and we will get you back in six months or hopefully sooner um, when it's more integrated into the and exposed for, for the developers. So um, thanks again. Thank you very much for, uh, for getting me on. It's a pleasure talking to everybody.